Well, hello and welcome to worship here at Newtown Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, on this October 10th, 2021. I'm Reverend Matt Krebin, and we are so pleased that you are joining us for this online worship opportunity. We hope that you'll find the spirit of Sabbath in our gathering today as we ponder what it was for God's own being to take Sabbath. Uh, the creative force of the universe to find rest as part of the creative process. And we're going to ponder what that might mean for us a little bit later in our service. Well, we have a few announcements for you today. One is if you're watching online, you're probably not with us, obviously, in person. Uh, but today, after worship, we are planning to have a couple of events. We first have a uh, opportunity for uh, confirmation uh, and for confirmands and their parents to learn about our confirmation process. So it's an information session. And if you're not able to be with us today, because, well, you're watching us online and maybe can't get there for a variety of reasons, but you have a confirma confirmation aged youth, uh, say uh, that would be a youth who's in uh, the equivalent of the ninth grade or older who hasn't been through our confirmation process and are interested in participating in that, uh, let us know and we'll make sure that we reach out to you and get you information. You can call the church office or you can email us and let us know uh, that you are interested and we'll make sure that you get the information that we'll be sharing today so that you might consider if you and your youth wish to participate in this process. We also are having an inquirers gathering today for folks who want to learn more about what it means to be a member of our congregation. That'll be at 12 noon. And uh, again, if you're not able to join us, but you really are interested in being a member of our congregation, reach out to us. Let us know, and we'll get you that information as well. And look forward to uh, maybe having you join us uh, as part of this strange, wonderful eclectic mix of folks who seek to serve and follow in the way of Jesus uh, here at Newtown Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. Also, we have another uh, uh, activity that's coming up. We are having our bar chicken barbecue and low country shrimp boil. Uh, that is a fundraiser for Back Bay Mission down in Biloxi, Mississippi. All the funds that are going to be raised for that uh, from our barbecue and shrimp boil are going to go to support the ministries and mission of Back Bay Mission. And uh, if you're interested, you uh, are being asked to pre-order so that uh, we can have your uh, items ready for you. And they're going to be uh, available just for pickup. There won't be any uh, eating uh, on site. Uh, we had debated whether we'd have tables or not available for, for some, but I think we're, we're going to go with a, a drive-in pickup. That's what we did uh, last year when we had this fundraiser, and it worked out really well, and uh, it is great food. So look for that information. It's been sent out in emails and others, or for some reason you don't have any of that, you can call the church office again or email us at the church office and let us know, hey, I need that information because I need to get me some barbecue chicken and I need to get me some shrimp. Um, and you can get a combo of that. So some people say, I don't really like shrimp. Well, you got we got chicken. You can order you know, chicken or you can order just uh, the shrimp or you can order a combo uh, if you're like me and you like to have kind of a taste of both. So uh, hopefully, and that's uh, October 23rd is uh, that, um, that event. So it's coming up in a couple weeks. So do get your orders in. Uh, those are my announcements for today. Um, let us come into this time of worship with God our Creator who moves in our midst even now. The creative force that brought all that is and all that will ever be into being. The creative force that recognized the power of divine rest as part of that creative process. May that one summon us now into the spirit of worship as we gather.
Good morning, church. It is so good to be with you from wherever you are tuning in from today. I have missed you while I have been on sabbatical these past 14 weeks, and I look forward to telling you all about our family's adventures this summer as we all transition back to a new program year here at the Newtown Congregational Church. So there is a legend um, from where we went this past summer. There's a legend of a giant rock on St. John U.S. Virgin Islands called Easter Rock. Legend has it that every year on the night before Easter, Easter Rock makes its way down from where it's situated in that picture on the side of the road um, to Hawk's Nest Bay, right down the hill, where the rock takes a drink of water and then rolls all the way back up to its perch on North Shore Road, which by the way is like one of the only main roads on the island. This all happens before the sun rises over the hill, according to the legend. So there's no one around to witness it every year. So even during the driest of droughts, Easter Rock will still be wet on Easter morning. And this legend is borrowed from the newsofstjohn.com. Another version of this same legend is that the rock itself, it weeps every Easter morning. Um, and that's another way of explaining why the rock just happens to be wet every year on Easter morning, even when it doesn't rain. Our family learned this summer to rely on the earth all around us as the means for sabbatical. Living on the island of St. John meant that Everything that we did from getting groceries to our activities for the day, um, even whether or not it would be safe to drive out on the rugged terrain that is all over the island. It was all dependent on what the earth was doing on that particular day. And so this morning, I'm wondering if there are some ways that God's creation or nature or the environment have anything to do with your weekly Sabbath. This morning, we're going to hear about how God created the earth and then God reserved that seventh day just for rest and relaxation and renewal, kind of like what we were doing on sabbatical this summer. For us, for our family, we discovered this means of Sabbath keep keeping through creation um, through our trips to our early morning trips to the beach, our time in El Yunque National Rainforest, where we lived for an additional week, um, snorkeling along the same schools of fish, literally on a daily basis, the impact of the tides of the Caribbean Sea, which was in our own yard, whether the ferries were running to the other islands all around us, whether it was safe to do so, what donkeys, goats, cows, chickens, horses, and yes, even one pig that roamed the island were doing at any particular time and how it impacted what we ate and what we did and what we discovered from how the people lived all around us all had deep connections to the earth. And so I'm hoping that maybe some of these pictures that I'm about to show you will serve as inspirations or reminders or ideas for some of the ways that God's creation can impact your own Sabbath keeping. Check it out.
as we take time during our worship this morning to pray with one another, we remind you that your pastors and your church staff are always here to pray for you. We are grateful when we receive your prayer requests and just your general check-ins um, to let us know how you're doing while we remain fairly scattered during this pandemic time. And so you can be in touch with us via email, phone call through our church office, text message, any way that you can be in touch with us is a good way to reach us. And so we take those prayers that we have received during the week and we incorporate them into our worship prayers today. And so friends, will you join me in a time of pastoral prayer this morning? Let us pray. Creator and creating God, this is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, O oh God, for this gathering of your faithful people, this opportunity to be with you and with one another for this time of Sabbath and renewal. We lift our prayers to one another and to you, even knowing that our entire lives our living prayers as we live and move and have our being in you, O oh God. And so we continue those prayers now. We pray for an end to this pandemic time as we give thanks for vaccines and low positivity rates and mask wearing that make it possible to gather and live safely during these uncertain times. We pray for the day when our young people and children will be able to receive vaccines and that people will continue to be persuaded that science is real and vaccines are safe for many and most people. We ask your comfort upon those who are suffering, O oh God, for those who are sick, grieving, scared, and disillusioned during this time, those who struggle to find hope in the world and in humanity. May they be strengthened to face these days knowing that so much good continues all around us and that one day this too shall pass. We pray for those who suffer in the midst of systems of oppression and injustice, economic oppression and scarcity, racism, homophobia and transphobia and xenophobia, the desecration of our planet and the environment all around us. As we marvel at the story of God's creation this morning, we remember and mourn alongside indigenous peoples for whom this holiday weekend is a painful reminder of the loss of land, culture, children, and life. And we acknowledge that our roots as a church are related to the purchase of this land, the church's land, from the Pohatuck Native Americans in the year 1711. We pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to stir us from complacency to justice in the creation of God's kingdom here on earth. We pray the silent prayers of our hearts at this time for ourselves, our loved ones, and the world.
We remember Jesus, who fully understood that Sabbath was a way to love God and to love himself. Let us continue our searches for the Sabbath making that is most meaningful and fulfilling, restful and renewing to each of us as we integrate prayer into our Sabbath calling and pray those ancient words that Jesus taught us now by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We should not forget that our offering should be the first fruits of our labors, which we dedicate to God. Not only do we honor God by this offering, but it also helps us not to keep the best of what we have for ourselves. By giving our first fruits to God, we help to ensure that those who have little will receive something, and we who have much do not keep it entirely for ourselves. And so, as always, this church needs and asks for your donation, your pledge, your offering this morning, because it helps us continue our ministries in the town of Newtown, in the state of Connecticut, and beyond. And so, you may gift us with your donation through our website or via check to the mailing address listed below. And so for those gifts that we have received and those gifts that we continue to receive, we give thanks to you and to God. We bless those gifts and we dedicate them to God and God's ministry here on earth by saying now. Generous God, we thank you for all that we have, for it comes from you. We gratefully return a portion of what we have to you. May our offering sustain and support the work of this church to close the disparity between those who have much and those who have little in this community. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Genesis. It is just a few verses about the last day of the creation story. Uh, if you remember, uh, in Genesis, we have the story of God creating the world. And uh, as the narration goes, God creates and days come into being. And we could get a whole bunch of other sermons about the rest of the creative process. And what is a day and how does all this work and how does this intersect with, with uh, our understanding of nature and everything else. But we're not going to look at all that today. We're just going to look at the seventh day as it's articulated in the Genesis narrative. Uh, and this is the day when, when Yahweh, when God has finished uh, creation and, and takes a break. Uh, and it keeps with our theme for this month uh, where we are continuing to explore the meaning of Sabbath uh, in our lives and as a people of faith and the implications for us personally as well as communally as well as really for how we live out our calling beyond our own even church community to be people of Sabbath and to bring Sabbath into the world more fully. Uh, and so here is the first story of divine, of, of rest in scripture. And, and the one who takes a Sabbath is Yahweh, is God. And the story goes like this. It's the Genesis 2 verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that God had done, and God rested on the seventh day from all the work that had been done. And so God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on the it God rested from all the work that God had done in creation. Here ends our reading. May God add understanding to these God's holy words. Will you join with me in prayer? 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Holy and gracious God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Okay, so here we have, as I mentioned, in, in scriptures, in the, in the narration of the story, at least in the chronological telling of the story, the first instance of Sabbath, of rest. And who is it that is resting? It is Yahweh. It is God. God rests on the seventh day. Remember, God has been about this creative process according to the Genesis telling how God, you know, brings light and separates light and darkness and day and night and mountains and oceans and the land and then all of the uh, animals and humankind and everything else. And God restores and brings this, uh, uh, this the world brings it into being, brings the universe into being. But then on the seventh day, we're told God rests and, and doesn't just say, I mean, God has been saying, and we, we've heard this before, if you're paying, paying attention to me about Sabbath, God, uh, God doesn't just, uh, when God's in the creative process, God doesn't say about um, this day, um, like the other days, when God finishes each day, God says, it's good. Uh, he looks at creation and says, it is good. Wow, this is good. But on this day, we're told God says this is holy. God hallows it and says this is a holy day. This is a hallowed day, a sacred day. Rest is, is holy and sacred. Not, it's, it's more than just good. So um, that day is hallowed. And Walter Brueggemann, who we've been in dialogue with uh, throughout Sabbath, because he's written this great book called Sabbath as Resistance, uh, talking about the, 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 the biblical narrative of Sabbath and the way in which the story of Sabbath is so instrumental to God's people throughout our sacred text. And yet, um, Sabbath, uh, and, how, and Sabbath is, is resistance even in scriptures, but in how Sabbath really is a form of, and can be understood as a form of resistance to some of the powers and principalities of the world uh, in which we live. Where, where we need to practice forms of resistance, if you, if you will, a response that says, no, we're not going to surrender Sabbath. We're going to live, we're going to lean into and live Sabbath rest. So um, talking about this passage, Brueggemann has uh, these words to say. He says, divine rest on the seventh day of creation has made clear that A, A, Yahweh is not a workaholic. B, that Yahweh is not anxious about the full functioning of creation. And C, that the well-being of creation is not dependent on endless work. Mm, wow, just a few verses? Yahweh makes that clear? Wow! Yeah. What does Yahweh make clear? Well, first, that Yahweh's not a workaholic. Isn't that interesting? God's not a workaholic, folks. So if we have God-like complexes, which... God reminds us and the sacred texts remind us we should kind of try to avoid being, you know, having God complexes. But those people that do have a God complex and they think I'm God, some, one, of the, one of the things that happens sometimes is they, they uh, are workaholics. They think everything is, is about me and me doing this and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work. I'm going to work. I'm going to show how great I am. Yeah? God's not a workaholic. God said, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to take a break. So God's not a workaholic. And then what, is, uh, what does uh, Brueggemann say? He says that Yahweh is not anxious about the full functioning of creation. God has brought creation into being, but God says, you know what? The full functioning of creation doesn't depend on me being in there every single minute of the day, every single moment. It's not dependent upon me. And that can mirror for us as well. Do we think that the world is so dependent upon us or our world, whether it's big or small world, or whatever part of our world we're talking about, and as, our, as our lives intersect, is it so dependent upon us that, um, that, that, that it won't function without us? You know, 
Do we have that anxiety that it's not going to, oh my God, what will happen if I'm not a part of it? Hmm. And C, of course, the last, according to Brueggemann, is that the well-being of creation does not depend upon endless work. That creation's well-being is not dependent upon our work making it, you know, or God's, in this case, God's work making it, um, you know, it's well-being. I'm going to have to take care of this. Oh, no, I'm sorry. i got to take care of this. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. Because otherwise, creation's going to just fall apart. No, creation's not going to fall apart. And, uh, and sometimes um, we lose track of the fact that we think creation or the world or the parts of the world that we are think we're in control of will fall apart if we're not doing things. And in some ways, it's, it's because of how we have misinterpreted Sabbath and rest. And we're going to get into that now. Because one of the things that happens right after this, so people you know, hear the story of divine rest and everything else, in some ways that gets lost. Remember, we've talked about this. Sabbath seems to get short shrift in people's, you know, when people talk about what's important in scriptures. You know, people argue about all kinds of things that are important in scriptures. Uh, and Sabbath, actually, in our society, in modern culture, is getting shorter and shorter shrift as a necessary under a necessary concept and construct for us to live in as people of faith you know um we we, we talk we, we we think it's busyness it's god wants us to be workaholics for god's realm uh or i'm going to be a workaholic in my in my job or in this or in that or we have and not just personally you know we have systems and structures that that that, that, that suggest you know that, that we can ignore sabbath and and here, uh, we've forgotten that. Cause, because what happens next in the story? Well, when human beings are developing now, and we have another story, you know, kind of probably two creation stories that get mushed together in Genesis. Because God's created human beings in, in this one. And then, but then God creates human beings again in the second chapter just after this. And God says, you know, be fruitful and multiply. And then God also says, um, uh, I give you dominion. I give you sovereignty over all of this. And this sovereignty gets us hung up, right? Because people say, oh, see, hey, God gave us the power over all creation. We're in charge now. And we lose track of how when God talks about creation, God's relationship with creation is different. We kind of then create ourselves as idols, as human beings, that we have sovereignty, because people talk about, well, nature is for, to serve us. We have sovereignty over it, so we control nature, right? We, you know, we're in charge, we can shape nature to, to serve us, right? And more and more as humanity has developed, and, and one of the ways in which we see this develop uh, is the development of, of science, right? Science that that is wonderful and, and powerful because it, it gives us grand insights and helps us to, to understand this universe and to understand this creation. So we don't want to say, oh, science, bad, Lola, we don't believe in science. No, we, our tradition believes deeply in scientific inquiry. But one of the, one of the, the curses of science, we have blessings of science, we also have the, cursing, the curses of science sometimes is that science has led us to believe that we have dominion and sovereignty over creation in ways that uh, mean that uh, the only purpose creation has is to serve us, to, to make this human endeavor what we think it should be. And if anything, in the last couple of years, as this pandemic has raged across the world, there's been a reminder to us that, for one, we don't necessarily have always the sovereignty that we think, the dominion that we think we have, right? And I think this is really important. If you noticed here, you know, in the pandemic, one of the things that we struggled with, one of the things we struggled with early on in the pandemic was we have this whole economic system, right? The system of work, right? Of labor. Uh, that's sometimes rooted not on Sabbath, right? of labor that says, hey, uh, and when suddenly we have a pandemic and hey, if people are going to work and people are interacting in certain ways, uh, that could be dangerous. 
But we also have this economic structure that said, hey, wait a minute, if we don't have people, you know, picking food in the fields, if we don't have people in our grocery stores, if we don't have people, obviously, in health care, if we don't have people, uh, police and fire, if, and if we don't have all these other folks and we don't have even people working in our economic, you know, systems on the market and everything else, if we don't have all this stuff happening, the world's going to come to a crash and, oh, we're going to have, you know, a terrible, terrible upheaval. So much so that some people said, hey, in order for us, you know, some people are going to have to sacrifice, you know, hey, it, this, is an, this is a pandemic. The, the early on, you had some voices that said, hey, this is a pandemic, and mostly older people. You know, some people get sick, yeah, and some younger people will die, and, you know, not, but not as many. This is mostly older people, so, hey, if we got to sacrifice some older people in order for this economy to, to not grind to a halt, because we, we need, you know, we, we need that to happen in order for us and the way we've built our world to function, then we may have to sacrifice people. Isn't that interesting? You know, when, when Yahweh talks later in Exodus, we talked about this last week a little bit, he talks about uh, the Ten Commandments, one of the things is don't create false idols. Here, work. Here, the market. Here, the, all these economic structures that we've created. That, in some ways, yes, produce incredible amounts of things and food and everything else for us, but also have made us dependent upon them functioning. And when, when nature throws us a curveball and we don't have dominion over it the way we think we do, suddenly we, have, we start finding ourselves and we find voices within our society that say, hey, yes, the economics was created to to make things better for human beings, but sometimes we're going to have to sacrifice some human beings in order for us to, to be okay. You know, uh, we have certain things we have to do. So Sabbath is an important concept here, folks. It, it is life and death, if you will, in our modern society, because if we don't understand that we are in a relationship with this creative energy of God who images for us, the fact that, that that creation doesn't depend on us. And if we're creating more and more of a world where we think we just have dominion over it so it will serve us and, and we can work it in ways that, we, you know, we, as long as we keep doing things, as long as we develop stuff, as long as we do things, we're going we're gonna to stay ahead of creation, then maybe we are losing track of the model that was first given to us of how God's creative energy understood that we're in relationship. Brueggemann goes on, he says, you know, the development of science, this is how he phrased it, was kept, was a key part in the attempt to ex for us to exercise sovereignty, as I mentioned. It was believed that through scientific discovery and technological progress, human beings would succeed in wrestling nature's secrets. Human beings would succeed and it would enable them to predict and channel and control nature's course. Beneath this enterprise lay thoroughly, uh, the thoroughly instrumental concept, conception of nature, which held that the natural environment was valuable only insofar as it could be exploited for humanity in its relentless pursuit of advancement. Nature was seen merely as a malleable matter available for the reconstitution in the service of human wants. Any notion that it was a force of independent or intrinsic worth to which human beings would sometimes have to defer gradually receded. Now, this is what's at stake when we think about this sovereignty and we lose track of, of God's relationship. God saying, you know, hey, nature's been created. I'm, I'm going to rest now. Nature has a life of its own and it doesn't depend upon me to, to control it and exercise sovereignty over it every single way. And in fact, if I'm not caring about the well-being of it, maybe I'm losing track of what's most important. Because Brueggemann goes on to this, he says, at least two points about this must be held in mind. First, the early chapters of Genesis envision not the despoliation, uh, uh, not the destruction of nature as a result of human arrogance, but the natural world is being harnessed and shaped so it might flourish all the more. Second, we must also contend with the fact that to tend the earth according to Scripture, part of what that means is part of what it means to be made in the image of God. Loving husbandry 
of the natural world is a reflection of God's own creative nature. That, that human beings are in partnership with creation. That creation doesn't serve us. Creation, creation was created because it was beautiful and good. It doesn't serve us. And, and we have to pay more attention to how we're not simply exploiting it for our own ends, not, not working all the time to say we have, uh, to try and prove that we have sovereignty. And that's what happens more and more when that nature goes rogue, like with a pandemic, and there's a virus and suddenly we're like, hey, hey, whoa, 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 nature, you're not doing what you need to do. Well, maybe nature is reminding us that we're, we're supposed to be in a partnership with creation, that, that maybe as human beings we're, lo we're losing more and more of that balance, climate change, there's a lot of big, natural questions about our human relationship with nature these days. And, and if we're not attentive to that, we're, this ties into Sabbath for us. Sabbath which reminds us that as God understood, God was in a, a partnership with creation. A partnership that didn't depend upon God be manipulating everything every minute of the day. And if we human beings, we think more and more we can just manipulate things to serve our ends. We probably are losing track of that concept of Sabbath. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I pray that God's Spirit will be with us and that we will see that Spirit flowing through creation. And, and as we pause and take Sabbath in our lives, and as we encourage Sabbath in the world, maybe God's Spirit will blow where it will the breath of the Spirit will flow through us, as this song reminds us. Spirit of God in the clear running water, blowing to greatness the trees on the hill. Spirit of God in the finger of morning, fill the earth, bring it to birth and blow where you will. Blow, blow, blow till I be but breath of the Spirit blowing in me. Down in the meadow the willows are moaning Sheep in the pasture land cannot lie still Spirit of God creation is groaning Fill the earth, bring it to birth and blow Where you will blow, blow, blow till I be but breath of the Spirit blowing in me. I saw the scar of the year that lay dying, heard the lament of the lone whippoorwill. Spirit of God, see the crowd crying, fill the earth, bring it to birth and blow. Where you will Blow, blow, blow till I be But breath of the Spirit blowing in me Spirit of God, everyone's heart is lonely Watching and waiting, hungry and still Spirit of God, we long that you only fill the earth, bring it to birth and blow where you will. Blow, blow, blow till I be but breath of the Spirit blowing. So my friends, I send us on our way with this benediction. Creator God, as we return to our homes, our workplaces, and our communities, may your spirit open our eyes anew to the vastness and splendor of your beauty all around us. 
May we hear and smell and see and touch your glory evident in all of your creation. Above all, let us see your beauty, even in the brokenness of our siblings, our brothers and sisters, all of them created in your image and waiting to experience the redemption that comes and was revealed to us through Jesus Christ. And now may we go to love and serve the Holy One this day and every day. Amen.